Hang in there. <laughs> We're about ready to get started. Hope everybody's doing well. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, if you're watching at home, which I saw a few people are, uh, please type any questions into the chat or comments on Facebook. This uh, is being recorded. This program is being recorded and will be available on the York County History Center YouTube channel. Uh, just a couple announcements before we get started. Uh, today is the seventh anniversary of All Bets. Yay. <laughs> I want to thank uh, Linda Bean and those who are no longer with us, uh, Jim Bean and Lila Foreman Shaw for developing this important program. Coming up at the History Center, we have a program uh, second Saturday of September on Faith Presbyterian Church. Our Civil War Roundtable is September 21st. The speaker is Dominish Miller, speaking about the 87th Pennsylvania Regiment. September 29th through the October 1st, we're going to have our Book Blast book sale. Coming back again, so if you enjoy book sales, please check that out. And our next All Vets is September 28th. The speaker is Jim Meyer and he served in the Marines in Vietnam. And that's you. Well, thank you, Jim. Yep. So he'll be here next month. Now I'd like to welcome Bill Rosevere, who will be speaking about his service in Vietnam. Thank you. Uh, my apologies to everybody. Uh, my back is not in the greatest of shape. And so I'll be sitting. Sometimes I'll stand up if I have to defend myself. <laughs> but nonetheless, I'll uh, try to uh, share with you, as long as my voice holds out, a lot of photographs. Some of the first photographs are from the web. And they will help me tell the early part of when I was a baby and how I got first grade and no, but <laughs> I'll, I'll talk a little bit as indicated it should about where we grew up. And then I'll go into more slides about <laughs> our military service. Uh, and with that, if you look at the screen, you'll see the title says, I was called eight, seven kilo. Does anyone know what that means? That's your call sign? That's my call sign. And that's what I used in Vietnam because I was one eight seven, a forward observer for a artillery battalion. And I was assigned alphabetically to one of the maneuver companies in the 1st Brigade of the 5th Infantry Division. And so if you go down through the alphabet and you've got enough battalions and you've got enough companies, Kilo is my call sign. But I was also called sometimes LT. And that's because I got a commission. So over on the table over here, I have my dress uniforms. They, the dress blues on the very left side of the table, I've worn twice. <laughs> Once when I got my commission, and the second time when I reported to the battalion commander at all places for Benning, Georgia. You're going to hear that name several times. So let's get started here. I'm not a native of York. My wife is. But I am from Altoona, and I think the two cities are very similar. They're blue collar worker cities. And in Altoona, the big dog, as far as work was concerned, is the Pennsylvania Railroad. The Pennsylvania Railroad is now gone. But growing up, I thought I was going to be a railroad engineer like my dad. My dad and grandfather were both railroad engineers. And my grandfather, he was photographed up here, was in World War I. He was stationed at Fort Lee, Virginia, 
in an ordinance company. And this is his campaign hat. And at the other end is a hat from my father. My father was in the infantry, but a special branch of the infantry. It was a railroad battalion. And he was sent over to Israel and then up into Persia. We know it as Iran now. And there my dad was for two and a half years helping to move supplies up to the Russians and the rest of our allies. He was there when the President Roosevelt met with Stalin and Churchill. So between the three of us, my grandfather, myself, and I, we were all citizen soldiers and have something to be proud of today. Growing up in Altoona, I wanted to share a couple of things, especially with my grandchildren who aren't here, but I believe they're watching. And that's some of the things that's on the screen here. One of the things that's not on the screen is something very important. It's a bed. And a general in our army recently this year had said that if there's anything you should do every day, it's make your bed. <laughs> it is a good habit to get into, and it gives you a sense of accomplishment. And it's simple to do. But I remember in high school, President Kennedy being assassinated. I also remember when there were black and white TVs, but they weren't portable like you see here. They were huge consoles, like a piece of furniture. And there were no school buses in Algeria. We all rode on public buses. There was no yellow buses just for school kids. Down in the bottom right corner there is a rack. That rack is going to be mentioned many times during my talk. And I was also a Boy Scout. And it was in Boy Scouting that I learned how to use a compass and a map. And that early knowledge that I gained helped me tremendously in my military three years and three months and counting career as a soldier in our army. The selected service selected me <laughs> and Elvis Presley. Do you all remember him? Oh yeah. Yeah. Elvis Presley went to Germany. I went to Vietnam. <laughs> I was inducted into the armed forces in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they were going to fly us down. There was no plane. So they went back to plan B and drove us in a bus, 200 of us in several buses, all the way down to Fort Benning, Georgia. At Fort Benning, Georgia, when I arrived after dark, I could see these 250 foot tall towers that you see in the bottom right photograph. I was to learn that that was for paratroopers learning how to jump out of planes. I resolved that I was not going to do that. <laughs> At Fort Benning, I went through basic training. I learned all that I needed to know about low crawling about shooting a rifle, about making my bed. And after that period of time, and I do have a yearbook somewhere laying around here, I got orders sending me to Fort Orr, California. Fort Orr, California was on the Monterey Bay. And when I got there, I couldn't believe how stunningly beautiful it was. Well, I was there less than a week. 
and they cut orders for me to go to AIT up at Fort Lewis, Washington. That's Mount Rainier. When I first saw that, I thought it was about five, 10 miles away. It's actually 40 plus, and it is huge. <laughs> The thing that I remember the most about Fort Lewis that first night that I was there was I could smell the pine trees. It was fantastic and it was cold. And I was happy because I knew that advanced training, AIT, up north there was not going to send me to Vietnam. I was going to be somewhere where it was cold. <laughs> Well, that didn't come out. <laughs> so what happened was I was sent from Fort Benning, Georgia on a tour of the country. I went across the country to California, then up to Washington, and then down back into Third Army country, Fort Rucker, Alabama. Fort Rucker was an interesting place. First of all, it had alcohol on base, but it was in a dry county. And any of us soldiers that got a pass would be approached as soon as we walked out the gate to buy a fifth of whiskey and bring it out through the gate. And we could get a little $20 reward. Well, I didn't do much of that, but Fort Rucker was also where they had fixed wing and helicopter training. And those warrant officers in those fixed wing was the main focus of Fort Rucker. But I did go through advanced infantry training there. And from there, I went back to Fort Benning. It's just across the border. Fort Benning is still the home of the infantry school. And it wasn't until, what, 10, 15 years ago, maybe, that the armor from Fort Knox was sent down to Fort Benning. I still think it was a bad idea. And the reason for that is it's not as big a maneuver area to maneuver in. And I know that also because it's not a big area to fire artillery in. But nonetheless, both of those branches of the Army are now down at Fort Benning, Georgia. I was assigned to the 197th Infantry Brigade. That's Hatch on the right. While I was in the infantry, we had lots of different objectives. One was to harass Rangers in their training. We also put on mad mittens, or longer actually, where they brought in guest politicians and industry captains. And we soldiers would defend the bleachers from an assault enemy coming towards us. Well, that's where I learned how to make food gas. Anyone know what food gas is? It's a poor man's napalm. What it is, it's gasoline with soap flakes. And you mix them together until it's gel. In a 55 gallon drum, you would put a concussion grenade at the bottom and a white phosphorus grenade near the top. And you pull the pin simultaneously. And that would eject all that gel gas up into the air. And so it would help deter the different avenues that the enemy may try to advance on. Well, on the right there, I'm the one with the 45 caliber pistol. And that 45 is on my hip for a reason. Me and my buddy there, we were assigned to be guards at the main post prison. I was assigned to escort prisoners in for court martial by being handcuffed in my left arm with a loaded 45 
to my right side because I was right handed. And about 10% of the population, I believe, is left handed. They would put a left handed soldier with his 45 on the left side and handcuff him to the other side of the prisoner. We would walk him in to be court martial. Did that for about a month. And I was able to return back to my duties in the infantry. While I was there in the infantry, hmm. I got asked by the company commander, do you know that you're AWOL? What? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, absent without leave? Me? No. He said, you can report it AWOL. <laughs> And you had orders sending you to Officer Canada School, OCS, out at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And you're due to do that pretty soon. You haven't missed a reporting date. Do you want to go? <laughs> well, I had all, uh, provided all the orders I had, so I wasn't able, but between 3rd Army and 6th Army and back to 3rd Army again, they lost track of my orders. So I was given the opportunity to go to OCS. OCS is conducted out of Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And it's also a place where Geronimo is buried, or at least where they think he's buried. At first, there was no markers for the graves out there in the Indian Cemetery, and he is being held there as a captive. And Geronimo has a link with Fort Benning. At Fort Benning, I mentioned, that's where they could learn to be a paratrooper and jump out of a plane. When they jump out of the plane, they say, Geronimo. <laughs> And it was to honor him and to show that you weren't afraid and you were able to do this with no problem. Well, Geronimo was told to me when I was out there at OCS, frustrated with being a captive of the US Army. And so he rode his horse off of one of the medicine bluffs that was a sheer cliff. That was all a lie. Geronimo was out on a horse in the dark and the horse fell down and Geronimo got pneumonia and died of it. And so he is buried out there, but the story about him riding his horse off this cliff to try to escape from the army is not true. Mm -hmm. In the previous slide, you saw pictures of me in red shorts. I was holding a slide board. I wanted to tell you that being in the artillery means you have to have something between your ears. That's not necessarily true of the infantry. It's not necessarily true of the armor. But you have to have something up here to be in the artillery. And the reason for that is it's mad heavy. When I started, there was 200 men in my training company. When I graduated, there was less than 100. It's a very difficult course. One of the things I had to do when I was out there was an escape and evasion course. And that escape and evasion course was a very difficult course. We had to start at one end of this thing, get to a safe zone near the middle, and that middle area would start to shrink by the hour. So you had a smaller and smaller area to get to so that you could get food and water before you would continue to the other end. Well, I got to, I got to the middle. I wasn't caught, but I had to now get out of it. I could see infantry soldiers patrolling different areas. So I started running up over a hilltop, 
and I fell off of a 35 foot high cliff. When I landed, I landed on my ankle and I sprained my ankle very badly. In fact, my ankles were still bad. But I crawled underneath some brush. And then I waited until the infantry had passed me before I continued down into the valley area heading towards the, my final objective. It got dark. I'm limping along. No one's found me yet, but I could hardly walk. And I stepped down into a ravine about six feet deep. When I got down into that ravine, I heard a rattlesnake. <laughs> and that rattlesnake was like for me to this bottle of water. I ran for a hundred yards before I stopped. I had no pain. I had all fear. But nonetheless, I got all the way across to the other end. And I was one of 20 guys that made it all the way through without getting captured. Everyone that got captured was put into a POW camp. And there they were made to lift logs up over their heads, sort of like what the CBs do out in San Diego. They, the ones that want to be Navy SEALs. It was a very difficult course, but I was glad that I got through it without getting captured. So when I completed my course at Fort Sill, I was given a dual MOS, Military Occupation Specialist, an MOS. That dual MOS was for being an artillery officer with cannons, <coughs> as well as an artillery officer with rockets. So I was one of the ones that was able to do either job. I ended up going to Vietnam and we didn't have many rockets. We did have air defense weapons over there and the MPs would use them. We had quad 50 caliber machine guns. We had double dusters, two 40, ca uh, yeah, 40 caliber guns that would fire for anti-aircraft up or level for perimeter defense. The thing I liked the most was the calibrated eyeball. I tell my wife, it's etched on my right eye so I can adjust vertically as well as horizontally, but actually it's in the binoculars. We didn't have the fine binoculars that the soldiers have today but we did have a reticle, a horizontal line with marks on them. And I learned how to use those extremely well. In fact, at OCS, I was taken to task for not bracketing. Bracketing is whenever you fire shells at the enemy and hopefully they're either in front or behind them. But then if they're behind them, you have to adjust your shells to draw like 200 meters. And then you would adjust to add 100 meters. So you're bracketing back and forth towards your target. Well, I can read a map really well. Well, I have those maps here and look at them later. And I knew when I didn't see my first volley that my target was at the edge of a 400 foot drop on what looked like a level plain. And I never saw any smoke from the shells or anything. That back and forth stuff was important to do, but I could read that map. And I dropped 300 meters and those shells landed right in front of those junk APCs, armored personnel carriers. And then I said, add 50, fire for effect. 
And the instructor was just upset that we doing that. I said, that's all I need. I could see with my binoculars, the dust being kicked up by the shrapnel. And I knew that at 50 meters, I was gonna get it. So that's what, the way I acted in Vietnam. Many times I called the target right off the gun target line and without much adjustment at all, I was right on. So after graduating, I went back to Fort Benning, Georgia. I don't know what it was, but Georgia was on my mind. <laughs> I was assigned to 105 battery. And it was then that I also was able to participate in some firing exercises at Fort Benning. I was a safety officer. I had to make sure that the targets being called were within certain limits, altitude and left and right. So we went out on a winter maneuver intense similar to this, which I copied off the web. And some other officers, not me, went off base in the middle of the night and they came back after going to a liquor store with booms armed and ripple wine. How many people know what Boone's Barn and Ripple Wine is? Yeah. So I, I brought back, I, they brought this uh, alcohol back and they were in my tent. And we were making a little bit of noise the more we imbibed. And I can still see it in my mind's eye. I hear the zipper going up and this hat starts coming through. It's a Lieutenant Colonel's hat. <laughs> and thank God it wasn't me, but somebody shouted, Ted, but and everyone stood up and the tent collapsed. Oh, no. <laughs> so the major came by very early in the morning because the next day we were going to fold up our tents and head back to base. And he said to me and my other tent mates, the colonel doesn't want any evidence of what happened in that tent. Do not take that tent down until you've gotten rid of the evidence. Well, we had our entrenching tools, and I've got one over on the table over there. And we ended up digging a hole, and burying all the bottles. Uh, we took the tent down, and my driver looked puzzled. He said, LT, what's, what's going on? What happened in the tent? I said, it was that way when we put it up. <laughs> so we, we almost got in trouble, but we survived. <clears throat> Other troubles were brewing in our country. <clears throat> this was the time when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And there were riots in various cities, including New York. And my wife said there were tanks here in New York. Well, I don't think they were tanks, but I think they were APCs, armored personnel carriers. But down in Baltimore, it was bad. There were snipers shooting. There was a lot of looting of stores. People were being killed. And the governor, Governor Spiro Agnew, does that ring a bell? No. He called the president and asked for troops to back up the National Guard. So from down in Fort Bragg, they sent about 5,000 paratroopers from the 18th, no, 18th Corps, Airborne Corps, and they sent us about 3,000 plus from the 197th Infantry Brigade. By the time we got up there, because we came 
I think two days after the airborne floor did, we were drilling on the airport runway with fixed bayonets, moving 200 men in one line, converging with other units, learning how to control people riding in the streets. It was a tough time. Question. Do you issue live rounds? Yes. We were issued 60 rounds. Our normal allocation would be 200 for the M14 rifles. And we were issued concussion grenades. And I have to tell you that as an infantry soldier, I was terrified. Okay, no, I'm sorry, as an artillery officer, I was terrified that we would have to kill American citizens in our country. Never had to. They calmed down, six National Guard, 500 Maryland troopers, state troopers, helped, and we were able to settle things down, but it was touchy for a long time. But we were issued 60 rounds. That was very scary for us. And we were worried about snipers being up in tall buildings downtown and how were we going to defend against them. So let me move on. While I was with the artillery unit at Fort Benning, I was asked to participate with another officer and Sergeant Cole is on the left here. We entered into competition with the brigade and later third army. And this picture is the trophies that were collected at the time. I won a second place award, not the main trophy. But it was quite an experience because I learned to shoot not just the 45 with match sights, but also a 38 and then a 22 match pistol. By the time you got done firing the 45 and you picked up that 22, your arm was rock steady. <laughs> and so it was great to, to learn to shoot at targets. I met Sergeant. Sally, or Major Sally Ford and Sergeant, I can't think of his name right now, Olympic champions down there at Fort Benny. They were great folks, so I learned a lot of them. Well, I was tapped to go teach at the infantry school. So I was no longer with the artillery unit there, but I was still stationed at Benny. And at the infantry school, I learned how to walk and talk as a teacher, as an instructor for the NCO school there. And I taught them how to use a map of compass, and I would then take them out to different areas. And I would drive my Jeep around the perimeters as they navigated through the woods, the swamps, and the fields of Fort Benning. Every once in a while, I'd pick up a dead rattlesnake or a water moccasin. So that when we met them after they went through the course far end, there'd be some examples of the kind of critters that were in there with them. Hmm. We never had anyone bit, but there were some big snakes there. Well, while I was still in the States. The first brigade of the 5th Infantry Division, mechanized, was deployed to I-4 in Vietnam. That was the area closest to the DMZ. And these are the units in that brigade. This is my artillery unit, and it was 155 and 8 inch. We had an 8 inch battery with this. And over here is the armor unit that I was assigned to. I now go to annual unions with that group of soldiers, 
and we just got back this year from out of Clackamas, Oregon, near Portland. We left just as the heat got up over 100 degrees. So we did have other maneuver units and often, oops, often the 61st Infantry and the 11th Infantry would call for reinforcements and we go in to back them up all over the DMC from the ocean to the Laotian border. I had to join them later. All the soldiers in that brigade were flown over, almost all of them, and the Navy landed at Wonder Beach, W-U-N-D-E-R, Wonder Beach. And they offloaded all of their landing craft, everything. Our tanks, our jeeps, our tents, all the Connex containers and so on. And it was there that the soldiers then assembled all their equipment and started deploying to the areas that the 3rd Marine Division assigned them to. We were operationally put under the control of the 3rd Market. And I have to say that they had a really tough job. The Marines, I'll bet Charlie too, Alpha 4, all those areas clear out to the ASON Laotian border. They had it when we came in the back of up. But I was in San Francisco and I reported the air base just north of San Francisco and they told me and hundreds and hundreds of others, we don't have room for you. We can't put you on the plane for at least a week. So I ended up with a couple other officers, who, one of whom had a cousin living down in Haight Ashbury. Yeah. And so we took a taxi and we drove down there. We stayed at this cousin's apartment. And they took us all over San Francisco. Telegraph Hill, got to see all the sites. The day we had to leave to go back up to get on our plane, one of the guys comes up to me and he said, with his long hair, hey man, could you send me a key? A key. I didn't know what he meant at first, but I see heads nodding. He wanted me to send him a kilogram marijuana, which I never did. <laughs> but I thanked him for showing us around San Francisco. Next stop of my journey, back up. Oh, I took it out, I'm sorry. Next stop was Hawaii, where I filled up, the, the plane was filled up with gas, and then we continued to fly over to Long Bin Junction. Long Bin Junction, also known as LDJ, was where I spent my first night. We were not issued any gear. They just put us in a hooch. And that's the first time I learned the word hooch. These are all metal roofed hooches. And between some of them, there were big pipes, about four feet high, that were covered with sandbag. And I said, Aren't you going to give us any helmets or flak vests or anything? They said, no, you'll get all that tomorrow. That night, we got rocket. And so all of us green troops rush out to go into this big pipe, about maybe that high, and about 20 feet long, sandbags at the ends of them. So in we go. We're running in there, no flashlights. It's totally dark. Any weapons? No weapons. Well, I had one. <laughs> and I smuggled over there. My dad and grandfather bought me a 32 auto pistol. I took that over to Vietnam and I did not claim it. And they never searched, and so I kept it. But in we go into this pipe. 
And all of a sudden, I'm hearing cursing and guys falling down, and I can't figure out what's going on. We had no lights or anything. What had happened was we were running into clothesline. The Vietnamese women who worked there on the base, they would do the laundry. And in the monsoon seasons, you couldn't dry those clothes outside. So they just took rope and they put nails through the, the pipe. And this thing was a spider web. <laughs> Welcome to Vietnam. Well, here's where I landed, down near Saigon. They flew me up to Da Nang and they put me in a Jeep. I then went up to the city of Wei, which is the old capital, and then on up Huang Tri. They're about 30 miles apart. So it's about 60 miles from Da Nang. That plane I flew on, some of you Air Force guys might recognize. And the picture on the right is one from today of the Citadel that the Marines defended at way. I rode those airplanes back and forth while I was in country. And I also went down with my captain, Jerry Brown, who's probably watching this from A Company, 1st to 77th Armor. And we were tasked later, uh, when I joined up with him, to figure out a way to recapture the Citadel. And when you look at those openings there, they're too narrow for a tank to go through. So Jerry and I decided to just blow a hole through the wall and drive the tanks up the rubble to get inside. So, oh, here's Wonder Beach. This is Quang Tree. This is LZ Nancy, where I spent a lot of time with the tankers. Over here is Long Bay and Quezon. And they were in the news because they were surrounded for a long time and because the weather won't let the Air Force deliver by 107 days in a row. How many? 107 days in a row they got bombarded. Well, and got a presidential citation award too. One of the yeah. few. Yeah. And then there's also Charlie 2 here and Alpha 2 up here. This is Dong Hall. This is the Kualia River. And later on, I'll show you some pictures of an operation that involved me being an outfit. We call this area, which has been evacuated of all Vietnamese down to the villages along the paved highway one. This was paved. We paved it. And the reason you can't hide a landmine in the paved road very well. And it made for rapid movement of troops and supplies up towards the DMZ. But I did actually report to LZ Sharon, right in that area. And my first night was in a Connex container about an eight by eight metal box that had supplies that were shipped in it. And they dug a hole in the side of the hill and put some sandbags on the top. And that was my bed for the night. Mm -hmm. um, that's my all. <laughs> you see, when the 5th Infantry Brigade landed, all those troops came from Fort Carson. If you didn't replace them slowly, either through attrition from get, being killed or wounded, everyone was going to go home at the same time. So they started almost right away replacing about 10% of the soldiers that were involved. 
and sending them elsewhere to other units and other parts of Vietnam. I was one of those replacements in waiting. My duties and out of that building and others later was to do civil works for the local people and to also visit families who had a member who was killed or a water buffalo that was killed and pay them money for their loss. So I got to drive all over the coastal plains and the foothills there where all the locals were housed in their villages. And I got a tip from a Red Cross man that these nuns needed some help. And so I got to know them. Can't see her well, but that's Sister Hong, and she could speak a little English. And she told me she needed good water for the orphanage. And I got a well here at the orphanage for those kids, and got an all mommy blank. When I went to visit them at the school. The kids were all up in a great big banyan tree. And I ended up waving to all the kids. And they came down and we walked into the school part. And in the building, the room about this size, up at the front was a yellow rubber glove. And when I pointed to it, the nuns all sort of got real quiet and wouldn't make eye contact with me. And all the kids got deathly quiet. Found out that when the nuns were unhappy with any of the kids, they put that glove on to spank them. <laughs> so the glove stayed up there. But the nuns invited me to come back near Christmas time for a meal that they had prepared for me. I still have the letter. They sent me a letter telling me through the MPs, they got a letter to me. Do not come. The day you come, the Viet Cong will be waiting for you. The priest had told them to tell me not to come. And then they told me come two days early. <laughs> so me and my driver showed up at Christmas time and my mother had sent me a little porcelain green Christmas tree, the night I, uh, you know, D cell battery would fit into the bottom and it would light up little lights on. I gave that to the nuns and they put it on their little altar and then they served me nine different kinds of rice. I mean, just different ways of preparing. My driver looked at me and he said, sir, there's only one set of silverware. I said, you're gonna have them. <coughs> they must have been from France because they are oxidized so heavily that I was glad I gave them to them. And I used chopsticks, which they provided for me. And they also had two kinds of beer, tiger beer, and I think it was 33 beer with the two brands. Bobby Bond. Well, pardon me? Bobby Bond. Yes. Your yes. Thank you. So I worked with those nuns and I got to see a lot of the beauty of that area. And on the upper left is a building. We weren't supposed to go in on any of the buildings. We had to respect them and so on. But I had got a glimpse of something inside. So I took another picture down here on the right. If you look closely, you'll see a gold Buddha sitting in there. That was a Buddhist temple. So I continued to travel around. And this time I was on a tank, and that's our 50 caliber gun up on top of Kupala. But it was a beautiful country. I was on the way up to, I think it was Charlie Two, and there was an uh, a Arvin battery up there. That Arvin battery was a 105 battery. 
and I inspected it because I was responsible at that point to check out all of the artillery bases. When I went into it, everything was beautiful. They had their guns polished and they had little uh, pathways decorated and so on, but they also had a rain the day before. And they had sent all of the canisters with the powder bags in them right next to the shells in a nice neat line. When it rained, all those canisters with the powder bags got soaked. So they just decided to dry them out. So over the gun barrels were all these powder bags drying. I made darn sure no one ever called in that battery to do anything because of wet powder exploding, partially burning or whatever in the barrel to throw that shell out. It could be a thousand meters short, a thousand meters long because you cut off the number of bags that you needed and discarded the rest so that the shells went the right distance. I also came across this church. I was fascinated with it. You can see the picture on the left. This close up I took. And on the right, this is what's left of that church today at Levang. That is a Catholic church. And that church was bombed in 1972. And all that's left of it is this facade. Hmm. That's just this portion right here. The rest of the church was bombed and then they tore the rest down. There was a big avenue of stations of the cross. I took a photograph of this one. Then I found this on the internet. That same cross is still there with other stations going down one side not the other. At this intersection, this is what caught my eye first. It wasn't a church, it was off in the distance. Those are my photographs of a temple. And it's a temple simulating a forest. And the Virgin Mary appeared in 1798 in the forest because the Buddhists were chasing these Vietnamese Catholics. And they went into the forest and they had this presence appear before them with a woman in Vietnamese clothing, a baby, and two angels escorting her. So, the Vietnamese people, the Catholic Vietnamese people, built this temple. This is the statue today, and it was garbed in the same kind of Vietnamese clothing that everybody wore over there then. And this is that temple today. It's been rebuilt, repainted, and it's a huge pilgrimage site today, just south and east of Palm Tree City. And it is an amazing thing. They got a pagoda up there, hotel. It would make anything here in York small beside it. Gas. Esso and shell gas along that paved road. Highway one. That's our fuel for the soldiers and the, the tank. Everybody were getting fuel out of bladders, but the engineers were also building fuel tanks. I did not understand why they didn't have them set further apart. I guess the rationale is the rocket's only going to hit one. That's Camp Red Devil. I was moved there from LZ Sharon in the Connex container. And I was put into an office in one of these hooches. That's the five-hour artillery that had a tower there. 
and in the foreground here is our washing machine. Doc Shotland and I and J.D. Witherington were the warrant officers. He was the warrant officer, J.D. And Doc and I were officers. We stayed in that hooch. Doc, uh, after the war, went to Switzerland. I don't know what happened to J.D., but he was the one to tell the guns what the weather was like two, three miles off. So he was a meteorological officer. That's me on the right. That's our office there on the left. Pretty. At Christmas time, and this is awkward for me because I just, I was stunned at this. Back in brigade headquarters, this was the 5 4 artillery Christmas dinner. They had white tablecloths, they had apples, they had milk. They had all these wonderful things, including lots of alcohol. And soldiers, the skies out of different LZs, we didn't get that. Doc Shotland decorated his hooch, and later I gave him some parachutes. He took surgical sheets and he lined the roof inside to help keep it cooler. That parachute over there, by the way, that's wrapped up on this table was from illumination that I used. Yeah, I know, I'm getting close to the time frame. Oh, yeah. My wife so, was supposed to give me time. <laughs> yeah, where was this is our morale officer and our dancing nun at Camp Red Devil. They actually okay, did bring they in did. entertainment from the Philippines mostly. And we did have a lot of soldiers and so on that got in there to enjoy a show or a movie sometime. No one under over the rank of spec four from our brigade was allowed to go down to Bob Hope's show. Bob Hope's show was fantastic, but officers and NCOs weren't invited. Oh. And that was fine by me. Those guys I lived and fought with, they deserved it. We sent two guys down from our tank company. And then they came back and told us what a great show it was. So in February, I was assigned to join with the A Company 1st 77. And I went back to LZ Sharon. We lived in tents there. We weren't living in any nice bunk hooches. Inside there, these guys were partying. <laughs> they were the tank crews, but they were standing on a PSP floor. Does anyone know what PSP floors yeah. are? Here's the thing. Thank you. Yeah, perforated steel planking or, or plain steel planking. I was asleep in one of these one night, and we got hit with mortar rounds. Mortar rounds were coming from outside our wire, and when we all rolled out on the tent flaps and fired up the tanks, and at first the M48A2 was what we had. They changed them to A3, and we had an engine that would run, start up a lot faster. We cranked the turret around, and we could see the flash of the mortar tube. So I called for artillery. I said, no, can't. So I said, okay, we'll just use the tank gun. We can see the mortar tube, we'll shoot the gun tube. They said, no, you can't. Huh? No, why? It was a friendly village. Oh. And that friendly village had a NDA or the Econ, probably crew in there using the village as cover. So I spent about seven months then with A Company 1st and 77th Armor. And I went all the way from the coastal plains out to Quezon and Line Bay and south onto the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Before I could get there, we had a strange uh, 
mission. LZN is in the background there. That's me in the foreground. LZN is a very narrow ridge with about a 60% slope. And that 60% slope wasn't meant for tanks to go on. But Jerry Brown, the company commander, and a platoon plus headquarters tanks got up there. At the bottom of the hill where we started after we came out of the jungle was elephant grass. Jerry's tank stopped down there. We took a captured NVA mortar tube and we started firing illumination. Well, it lasts about a minute and then you run out of illumination. My job was to fire illumination for hours. So I used that parachute as one of the shells that I fired over the top of this hilltop to keep everyone lit up so we could see who was around us. And we took all the tank tow cables, hooked them up to the two tanks, made it up, and then we pulled all the rest up. And we got up on top of that LZN. Some of those tanks stayed up there, the, the platoon for sure, for almost 35 days, I think. I have to check my letters from my to my parents because that's where I got a lot of the information. I found the letters that I'd sent home. I was able to extract from that dates and activities and what we were doing. This is burn pit, by the way. Yeah, we had burn pits in Vietnam just like we do today. I'm glad our soldiers today finally got support from our government to treat them. <clears throat> Colonel flew up to congratulate Jerry Brown, who's on the right there. And uh, that's a major that was supporting him you know, from the headquarters. He flew in, but that was right at the beginning. We then got socked in with fog so thick that we for a week and a half, two weeks, we could not get resupplied. So we were up there counting shadows in the dark. And we had two men on duty, not just one, and two men sleeping. Am I supposed to hold on closer? Thanks. <laughs> Okay, I need her. Did you start digging up your box holes that you buried your food that you maybe threw away? Because we had to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyways, they were socked in up on top there. And the first sergeant from the tank company, probably the finest man I ever knew, Sergeant Joe Offit. He was the first sergeant. He comes out in a helicopter and we could hear him up in the fog and the chopper pilot was afraid to land. I'm talking with the chopper pilot and I'm telling him that you've got some clear area below the cloud cover. He says, well, I, I'm afraid to come down because it's going to hit the mountain. I said, I'll tell you what, you can find me because I got to fire a flare up through there. Fire a flare up. Almost hit the helicopter. Wow. <laughs> the guy just came right back down, landed. Sergeant Offit and I met. Sergeant Offit had the mail for all the soldiers. He also had two fifths of whiskey underneath his <laughs> black vest. And we went around giving mail to all of us, and they all got a shot of whiskey. <laughs> was sharing the same bottle. He was terrific. And he ended up being command sergeant major before he retired. And he was stationed and living down at uh, Fort Bliss, Texas. He passed away recently. And that's my recon sergeant with the binoculars on the left, Sergeant Robertson. And Sergeant Robertson, and I have a tale I'll show you here shortly. So, Air LC and is not on any of our maps. 
but the 61st Infantry knows where I was at. When the fog finally lifted, Jerry had the cook from the tank company come out and he cooked us fresh eggs. All those sea rats we had and powdered eggs, this young man brought us out fresh eggs. I don't know how the supply sergeant got it, but he said that the story was that they brought in these frozen eggs from the States and they left them sitting on the runway okay. and they were starting to heat up. <laughs> so bingo, sun side up. <laughs> yeah, there was a little a little trip down to pick up a bunch of eggs, and then a helicopter took them up to us up on top of that LZ. Next, we went across the river at Palm Tree, heading north. Our big guns had been moving up, and we were going up to support the Marines. And that's me when I was at my pooch at LZ Nancy. And occasionally I would get a haircut, but we had to take the electric haircut snippers away from the barber. He started cutting our skin on our scalp. He was so excited. We, looked, oh. we gave him his hand clippers to, to cut our hair after that. That's my bunk. It's a folding cot. There is a sleeping bag on it. I never thought he had sleeping bag, <laughs> but it was cushioned. At one point at LZ uh, Sharon, the temperature was 49 degrees. Mm -hmm. I wrote that down in a letter to my parents. At LZ Nancy, many nights, it was over 100 degrees. Gentleman on the right is my classmate. Artillery OCS, Carl Caprillion, and he was the XO for the eight inch battery. And the talk on the left, I had to work out of several times. Well, one of the uh, talk fire direction officers, Captain Zlotnik, was sent out to Kason. So I took over the job of controlling all the fires in that area. We had a lot of sand, and a lot of sand bags. And by the way, my hooch, I had raised it up to chest high, not like it was when I first got to. We had a shower, and that's what that yellow tank is, and had a submersible heater in it. And we'd wait until after dark. Me and Jerry Brown and the executive officer Chuck Winslow, we all had our own individual bunker hooches separated by the blast area of a, a rocket. So I'm out there taking my shower at the start. I'm wearing goop boots. Everyone knows what those are. Goop boots were made from truck tires that were ruined, and they take a couple of X's of rubber from the inflatable rubber interior. And they'd slit them and they'd sell us the Vietnamese did it. They'd sell us these boots or shoes or flip flops. So there I am, and rockets come in. And you can hear a motion when they're coming, and it hits and took off. I ran back to my hooch. I grabbed my, I was always carrying a helmet and flak vest. I grabbed my maps, my compass, a flashlight, radio, and I went looking for where those rockets had landed. I found one over near Carl's battery, and I found another one up behind our tank company area. By looking at the crater, you can find where the Q's drills down into the ground. It's a little tiny tunnel. I had a wooden dowel rod that I put into it and I was able to get an angle for that rocket and I was able to get an asthma, left, right, whatever. And I called that into my own battery right there 
and LG Nancy. So they'd be 140s. About 122. 122. Yeah. We returned fire in that location and, and the next day we went out and we only found two dead NDA and a lot of uh, supplies and stuff. But there were no one, no one was live there. Why do you use yellow for your shower? Sir? It's a pretty big target, isn't it? Yellow? In the dark. Yeah, in the dark is not. <laughs> yeah. In the daytime. Maybe it was our uh, supply sergeant who couldn't get any black paint. I don't know. <laughs> huh? I just thought that was kind of crazy. Yeah. But we wait until after dark. Yeah. Just three of us will go out there, and we were right at the wire. So, yeah, in the distance was the what we called Indian country, because there was no good people out there. Right. I feel bad for Native Americans today. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> All right, so that's a 155 self-propelled howitzer. And close-up look at this one shows on the right side of the screen there are a couple of geese flying united. And uh, they, they were pretty accurate. I, and that's one of the shells with a fuse on it in the background there. I used them most of the time, but if I wanted really accurate fire, I used an eight inch artillery. You could put a shell from the first shell, you could put a second one into the same crater. Couldn't do that with uh, 155. How far are they good for? Uh, yeah. I'm going to say the 155 was close to 20 clicks. Uh, 105 is probably 11 clicks. That's kilometers. Yeah. So these are some of the guys from the headquarters tanks. And I have become, as years went by, very close friends with him. And I'll tell you more about him. I know it's late. And this guy was terrific, Jerry Oberin, and I were the company best chess players. <laughs> and these magnetic chess pieces, some of them have been broken off and all, but it still has my LT name in there. We played chess on top of the turret of the tanks. So sadly, I found out that he died two months after I left Vietnam. This is their headquarters and for the life of me, I don't remember a company's office, but it's a, it's a uh, credit to the supply sergeant, the first sergeant that they were able to decorate it up so nicely. That other guy that I pointed out, his name is Bob Rushforth. I don't know. I don't think Bob's watching tonight. He's going to see this. Bob Rushforth was an artist. In our tank barrel, he painted in hot orange, we the people, and on the other side of the barrel, down the length of it, for the people. And he also painted a serial cartoon character, Captain Crunch. I don't know how much Jerry Brown likes to have, but we all thought it was pretty fun. He also decorated the inside of the clubhouse for the company of tankers. He was very talented, but the battalion commander didn't like it. He found out that Bob had painted different areas stop the war, peace now, all those kind of things. And they ordered Jerry to tell artists to remove those. So Bob, he complied, you know, he smeared things up a little bit and so on. But somehow that got painted in up on the top and denied the truth. We were, we were stubborn, you know, we, we and I say we, officers, NCOs, enlisted men, we were doing our job. We would occasionally get some warm beer 
And uh, by the way, I did buy beer out their case on and had it blown out. And I think I paid $20 for a couple hundred cans of beer. And we took the fire extinguisher from our ammo trucks and used them to cool the beer down. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a couple of photos here of, of our driver, Gary Goodwin, who's recently passed away. And I just want you to get a sense of what it's like living inside a bunker with the walls made out of ammo boxes filled with sand. It was hot, it was dirty, it was hard work. And this is our backup driver, Gary Greer. He lived down in uh, Athens, Georgia. He recently passed away. And this is another picture of Jerry Oberlin. You can just see how beat down we were. I weighed 134 pounds. I was heavy. <laughs> you know, all these guys were like popsicle sticks. You can see how sweaty they are down into the groin sweat. It was a top top line as Jerry went over. We were all skinny at that age. <laughs> yeah. We did uh, come in contact with the enemy. When we did, we tried to capture some of them. <coughs> this is a, a North Vietnamese soldier that we encountered him as he ran into elephant grass. So Jerry and the tanks formed a square that open grass, and then they started using the tanks to mow it down. And eventually, this guy popped out, and we captured. <coughs> we never tortured any of the enemy. We treated them with the respect of a fellow warrior. And I'm happy to say that none of that stuff about shoving them out of helicopters and stuff. I never saw any. This is a Chu Hoi scout. He surrendered to us. He went through an indoctrination period. He was to point out booby traps, all kinds of possibilities that might harm us. And he rode in our tank. He's holding up an RPG, which is not a friend of a tank. No. That's a 175 artillery piece. This is one of the guns where you're moving up to like Charlie 2 uh, to reinforce the. Is there a Charlie 1? I never saw it. I saw Charlie 2, Charlie 4, Alpha 2, Alpha 4. More fire bases up there, right? Yes. Okay. And a lot of those fire bases up along the DMZ were actually French forts. And then we came in, the Marines, and they enlarged them and fortified them better. So Jerry and the XO, Chuck Winslow, and Top, the one there squatting down with the hat on, they were talking about our next move. We drove up to Dong Ha, and the Navy floated us across in landing craft where we joined up with the Marines, which had their own way of getting across the water. We were to join with them and glide up through the sand dunes into the DMZ. This is the Marines' way of going across. I felt bad for the Marines in many ways, because often they'd still be eating sea rats, and once in a while someone flies some eggs out. For but when it came to their equipment, they were possibly borrowing stuff for us, from our tanks to help fix up theirs. They floated across the river and so did we, but I like their way of doing it better. We made a, an incursion into the DMZ. We picked up uh, a couple of tunnels and we ended up uh, uh, encountering no one in the dark. But we had our infrared uh, light on the barrel of our tank, very big spotlight, and we used it to travel in the sand dunes overnight. 
and we didn't see any enemy then. By the way, that's a plastic explosive, and there's some dead cord in there. But we would take chunks of plastic explosives. I say we, the soldiers, we would break off a chunk about the size of your thumb, take a match to it, and it would boil water in the mess kit cup. We talk about C4. Yes. Yeah. Plastic explosive. Yeah. So C4. Uh, was being used on both sides. But that stuff needs a shock in order to explode. But if you just light it, it burns rapidly and burns very hot. While it's up along the DMZ, I was given a top secret crypto clearance so that I could uh, call naval gunfire and air support. And I was able to hear a fire mission being sent out to New Jersey, sitting on top of my tank with my crew and all the other gun crews, our tank crews around the area. I told them to watch and I tried to locate for them the target point. You could see the shells traveling from the ocean into the DMZ. Each shell was 2,000 pounds. It was amazing. They found and blew up an underground bunker complex, and you could see with our binoculars, you could see North Vietnamese coming out, holding their heads, looking up for the B-52 bombers. There were no B-52s. <laughs> Along the DMZ, we cleared the area so that there was no cover. One of the ways we did that was to burn it. So we would use fire as a way to keep the enemy from getting through. And then we headed to Quezon. That's Bob Rushforth with his funny painted helmet. He's carrying a shotgun. When we got into the dense jungle, we'd like to have that shotgun in case they were right against the tank. He's helping us go across our own bridge. Our tank company had its own track vehicle that carried the bridge that would unfold across small streams. He's guiding us across. Did you see uh, the chopper spraying Agent Orange in the heavily? Yes, I'll, yeah. I'll show you a photograph. Okay. Okay. This chopper here represents what happened on our way up to Quezon. We stopped at the bottom of the big hills while we were going up. It was a one lane hill. And the infantry jumped off with their armored personnel carriers. This one boy, young man, reaches up to pull his M16 down and he shot himself in his abdomen. Oh, no. Yeah. It, 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 it was amazing. He, he was pulling down on it. And the barrel? Bam! Shot the right. pulled the barrel down. Didn't yeah, he? pulled the barrel first. So he was still alive. And so we called for a medevac. Medevac wouldn't come in because they were afraid it was a hot zone. We kept telling them it's not hot. Uh -huh. Battalion commander in his helicopter landed and they took that guy to the hospital ship. That same night, we were driving up through the mountains and we picked up a 12 foot long strand of wire, which rolled up into a bar. Ball. It was barbed wire. It was along the edge of the road. It finally threw the track in on the rear sprocket and we couldn't go anywhere because it was the lead tank. So the crew had to break the track, unbolt everything. And that track weighed a ton and a half. And there was this stupid lieutenant in the artillery who was standing there watching the wall. And he took a tanker bar and he jammed it in as the track was rolling off on front of him. And it picked him up and threw him like a rag doll. Wow. That was me. 
You were okay then. That's why you have a bad back. <laughs> well, they actually did fly me back to the Italian surgeon and he put me on Darvo. <clears throat> they don't even use Darvo on today. I was a floating head for a day and a half. <laughs> I was so happy. Anyways, I just wanted to say that the, the uh, tank company also had a tank retriever and maintenance crew. They did a great job keeping our engines running and fixing this up. Hi, baby. Hmm? <laughs> so, this is a B-52 bomber. Yep. I would stay up at night on guard duty, watching for shadows. And every once in a while, we get what we called an arc of light. An arc light is where the B-52 bomber or a team of two or three would fly over a gap in the mountains and they draw their load into that gap. And the arc, the half moon circle of illumination from all that ordinance going off, why we called it an arc light. Craters up around Quezon, 75 feet wide, 45 feet deep. That was all because of the Air Force helping to keep them from getting to the base. The red arrows here represent the Ho Chi Minh Trail and all the supply routes down to Laos and Cambodia. And it was up here that we were deployed at that arrow. And when I was up there with them, we were trying to get to the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so we drove down through the mountains. And I remember another lieutenant who was so, so smug. He walks off of his tank up on the top of this knob, big meadows out in front of us. He had just been firing. Artillery at seven North Vietnamese in the open, about half a click away, 500 meters. It was high angle fire, frustrating, couldn't get it because the winds were moving the shells up in the top there. Finally, we got the shells to where we last saw them. I don't know ever, you know. But that guy afterwards took a walk up to the top of this knob. There's a sharp drop off on the other side. He walks along the edge of that drop off. And he's thinking maybe I, I can keep something up here. And that's when he looked down at his feet. And there were chopsticks right there. I was scared. <laughs> I was scared. Chopsticks in the jungle right there. What's the chance? So the bad guys were all around. They were there. Yeah. This is case on. We pulled into case on. It had been abandoned by that time, but it was still a, a perimeter wire. And I ate in a monsoon on that runway. And the rain was coming down so hard, I was getting welts on my skin on the back of my poncho line. It was amazing. The infantry didn't like walking through the jungle. They were always asking if they could ride on our tanks. And we were always hauling until we were coming down near Lang Bay, we're coming down through big elephant grass areas and stuff. And all of a sudden, the infantry on the tank up ahead of me started jumping off. And the reason they were jumping off was because there was a cobra trapped in the tracks. Oh, yeah. And that cobra was flailing around. It was like six feet long. Wow. And it's just head flopping all over the place. And all those infantry guys didn't want to be on that tank. <laughs> that's a code off. That's in Laos. 
every one of us artillerymen and tankers that were out to Lang Bay, we tried to hit that map. It's called the Go Rock on the maps. The reason why you tried to hit it is that night, you could see the fires rolling out of the caves. And we kept trying to put the lights out. <laughs> This is a photograph of uh, back at one of our fire bases. A gentleman right here I want to recognize. That's Dave Cavanaugh. And Dave Cavanaugh got a broad star over there. So did Gary Goodwin, driver of the tank I was on. And I got a broad star. I went to the hospital ship to see my recon sergeant who got malaria out in case on. Sergeant Robertson was down in the hospital section of the ship. And me and the chaplain brought out mail and other items to give to him. And we sat and talked for a long time. And the time for lunch. And I ended up saying, well, let's go get something to eat. You can't eat with me. I said, what do you mean? He said, you have to go up to officer's country. <laughs> I am stripped of all my weapons. I mean, my 45, my grenade launcher, my M16, everything is gone. I had to turn them in when I got onto the ship. But I am filled with dirt. I am caked with mud and dirt. He said, Yeah, you have to go up to officer's country. Huh? So, okay. So I go up to officer's country. And as soon as I walked through the air conditioned door, the dining room was right there. And it was almost full of men and women in their dress caps. Um, you know, here I was. <laughs> Is that the USS Sanctuary? Yes. I was on that ship too. Okay. Oh. Yeah, that's the sanctuary. I took that picture as we came in. Yeah, May 1970. Okay. So I'm standing there at the table and everybody is looking at me. And I said, Did I do something wrong? He said, No, you have to say the prayer. I said, why? He said, it's because you're standing in front of a ceramic dog. It had a little porcelain ceramic dog thing that was there. I said, okay, Lord, thank you for this food. Let's eat. <laughs> <laughs> that was my prayer. Uh -oh. I never saw Sergeant Robertson after that and went stateside. This is the train we flew over. You can see how flat and sandy it is. Uh, Governor Tom Ridge, uh, he was over there in the same area. The street without joy is what we called it. We would take sweets up through there uh, looking for Viet Cong and so on. We're building a pontoon bridge here, an old bank to uh, defensive position there. You can see in the bottom here, lots of rice paddies and homes and so on along the edge of the sand dunes. We sometimes had tanks at bridge crossings that we wanted to protect. In this case, it's concrete uh, structure. But you can see that there is a convoy of tanks and APCs. This was not a good time because we were heading north and the soldiers on them were throwing candy to the kids as they were driving past. Every once in a while, these candy would bounce back out onto the road and a kid would start out there to grab the candy. This is the kind of thing I had to do when I first came in country. I had to go to the family, to the village chief, and I had to sit down and apologize to them. 
what I still remember today is the dirt floors, but the cleanliness of those huts, those, those little villages, the people were clean. And they expected money, which I didn't believe I was supposed to join it until I told them, no, that's customary here in this country. So I paid 50, no, yeah, 50 dollars, uh, not dollars, but the asterisk for a child that was killed. I paid 500 piastres for a water bottle. Oh, wow. Getting close to the end, I hope. I apologize for how long I'm taking. This picture is blurry, but it's a picture of a bulldozer in front of our tank. We are tasked to go into area 101, which is in the foothills area to the west of the coastal plains. We had this bulldozer making a road. And we went in with him and he got shot at once. He just lifted the blade of the dozer up, rolled over the back, dropped down with his M14 rifle, uh -huh. emptied the clip, and let us move up to back up uh, to cover him. We got the road built. I went on R and R. That's the only picture I have that I want to share. But I got to Sydney, Australia. It was beautiful. I loved it. Yeah, it was yeah. Well, what I'm showing here is the sweater I bought there because it was cool and the clean sheets behind me. Huh. I loved it. Five days on R&R. &R, Met a Kiwi girl there. Um, she was from New Zealand. And apparently her accent was slightly different. So she was, was not treated as well as the rest of the Australians treated each other. What month were you in? Pardon me? What month? Because it's reverse season from, from June 3rd. I came back from all in one. It was fantastic. Uh, I saw the uh, opera house. And, we went to museums and stuff. Yeah, it was great. Did you build it again? Yeah. So back I came and I started to uh, support the tanks again. And uh, you'll see this quick sequence of shells. I was uh, putting artillery on different uh, bunker complexes. It's fun. Tank in the foreground here. This is an Asian orange area with a loach, a white observation helicopter. And you can see it's all brown and stuff. This had been sprayed. Mm -hmm. But I like the loach because it was a decoy. I started using Huey Cobras, which were armored gunships, helicopters. And they put the loach out ahead of them. And the Huey would stay back and up higher in the loach fly along, walking back and forth, but it had a stinger. It had a chain gun in it on the side, so it was always leaning down. And if it got fired, that it emptied the chain gun and it swerved out of the way and the Huey Cobra would come in and it would hose the area down. It was interesting, all the different uh, commanders that came out uh, they always came out in their fancy helicopters and stuff and uh, talked to us guys. Uh, down along the shore, I got to see some boat people and uh, got to talk with uh, some of them. And they were very polite people. They were fascinating to me and still are. Their sanitary facilities are somewhat limited. Those uh, overhanging portions of the buildings were their toilets. If the ground was firm, they would go out into their rice paddies. And in a rice paddy that wasn't planted, they would, as a collective village, use that field for their 
sanitary toilet. And then they would rotate a couple months later to another field, another, and they, that one would get flooded, the first one, and they would plant it with rice. Makes sense if you really think about it. So we had a bunker complex in the uh, hills here. And so I had a uh, forward, what's the thing? Back? Back. Yeah. Forward air control. I fly out his plane, and we fired a white phosphorus shell in there, told we one planes dropped the bombs in. By this time, Captain Jerry Brown had left and we had Captain Sproul replace him. We brought in two F-4s with their bomb loads. And this is what happened. The first F-4 came in and less than a second, split second, he had an early release. And the bomb landed very close to our tanks. Wow. Rocked one up on its treads back down again. Ooh. The back said, I'm breaking them off. And I said, no, do not break them off. Bring the rest in. We want to hit that complex. Infantry wanted to get in there. We had a ring with tanks. I didn't want the infantry to have to fight to win it. So after we cleared up that mess, the guy's ears were ringing, but everyone was safe inside because I had them all buttoned down. We ended that uh, flight successfully. I had back for that bulldozer we had. <laughs> Uh, a pretty serious mission. The infantry was going down that road and they weren't doing a good job of sweeping it. And we were nearby, two or three clicks away. And they called for support because they got ambushed. And the captain of the infantry had a broken collarbone. I remember that because it was in the letter I wrote to my parents. And we came in with one platoon plus the headquarters tank, the one I was on with Jerry. And we stabilized the situation. There's no more contact with the infantry. And so they decided to send in third platoon tanks with food. So they took the turrets and they put down through the loader's hatch boxes of sea rations, big cans of water. So in comes a third platoon and I'm up on the hilltop and I see the tanks coming down and into the edge of a ravine valley and suddenly, the third platoon sergeant's tank gun skews around. And I see him leaning back with his 50. They were ambushed. And so all the tanks start throwing out sea rations and everything as they're fleeing from this ambush. And I called for artillery. And what I did was I fired on the gun target line. I knew where I was at. I knew where the guns were at. And I told them where the coordinates were for my first round. My first round was HE on the deck, high explosive. Normally you don't adjust for high explosive. I always do. I put a round in that river where that bulldozer was at in the first photograph I showed back there. It was right at the bottom of this valley. 
And I figured if they were running down that valley, I had them cornered down there. So I have them just left on the gun target line, 500 meters, five clicks, fire for effect. That was right on top of us. What I did was I had Jerry tell everyone in the tanks to close the hatches. And I had the guns load with a big T fuse, variable time fuse. And what that does is it says, okay, it sends a radio signal out. And when it gets to 50 meters above the ground, it explodes. I had those shells blow right on target, right over top of me and all the other tanks, and down into that valley where the third platoon got ambushed. I was the only one outside. <laughs> I had reached underneath the tank in the rear, and there's a telephone. Huh. And I picked up the phone, and I talked to Jerry. I said, I've got HE coming in. I'm going to tell you when it's shot. You tell everyone, make sure they're buttoned up. I get the word shot over. And then as shells came towards us, they say splash over. And that's five seconds before they hit. So I'm saying splash. And Jerry's saying the same thing to the rest of the tanks, and off they went. We stopped them cold. And I got the bronze star. So I think that's about all I need to share with you, except I did take a walk with these guys after they were rotating out of Bob Elwood, the FO that I replaced who was wounded, he came back from Japan. He came back to that same tank company. We used to see these Arvin Recon soldiers out there in our area. I was assigned to take a walk with them for a couple of weeks. Me and an Australian warrant officer. And that Australian warrant officer, he was a great guy. I, I got letters from him. And he ended up, uh, he called them little guys. Little guys. The little guys. They were tough. They were no worse, no better than us. Some of them weren't worth as much, but I was proud to be able to be out here with an Australian war officer. So I flew out of Vietnam. I landed in Anchorage. We refueled. Came down to Fort Lewis, Washington, <coughs> back to that volcano with snow on it that I saw so many years before. It was also a Nike Herc base, and I didn't know that at the time. But Nike Hercs were used on the borders of our country all the way around. Every major city on the borders had Nike Herc batteries. San Francisco had. I was assigned much later after I got back home as a reserve officer. I was assigned to Fort Bliss as a mobilization designee. Yeah, I'm almost on school. <laughs> mobilization designee meant I didn't have to go to monthly meetings. I just had 24 hours to get to my assigned station. And I did that. While I was going to college, I went to forestry school at Penn State, Mount Alto campus, and then up to the main campus. And I spent 37 and a half years working for Pennsylvania State Parks. Wow. And that's my story. Thank you. Uh, how much?